right, I got a different place for you today. This is uh, a place called Scotchtown. And it was the home of a man named Patrick Henry, who you may all have heard about. And if you're like me, you've heard about him for one thing. He gave a speech in 1775 that was quoted everywhere. And he said, as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And uh, it caught on. And that's kind of the thing that everybody knows about Patrick Henry. But there's a few other things that are just kind of amazing. Some of them I just learned taking a really nice tour here. But let me tell you real quick what was going on here. This place was his home and for just about five or six years. In uh, like 1771 or two up to 70, 76, 77. And so there's other places you can go to. They're also known as Patrick Henry's home. But this one is the original building. Over here we've got some sheep. These are some kind of uh, authentic breed of sheep that came from, Mon or came from uh, Mount Vernon. And uh, so let me get to the front of this place. Let me just give you a quick what I think about Patrick Henry. First of all, if you ever go to uh, Monticello or... Um, Mount Vernon, you'll notice that this house, oh, I just covered that all that whole way through my friend. You'll notice that this house was um is not as grand as those houses, but it's still a really nice house for the time. Really nice. The original part was just the stuff on the left of that entrance, and they added on the stuff to the right. And uh, there's a kitchen over there, because they cooked over there to keep all the hot air and stuff out of the house. There's an ice house in the back. I'll try to get a picture of that, but it's pretty cool. There's a 29 foot uh, hole in the ground, shaft. They'd fill up with ice and then they'd go down with ropes and get the ice and bring it up. In the middle of the summer, they could still have ice. So if you came here back in the 1770s, you'd come through that gate, come through that gate and you would come up to this house and there would have been some more uh, things out front, some plants and uh, probably an entrance closer up to. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Patrick Henry. First, um, you got to love that he was a lawyer. Uh, most of you know, who know me know that I'm a lawyer, so I kind of like lawyers. It's kind of cool. But here's the thing about him. He was a completely self-made man. He taught himself everything. He taught himself how to become a lawyer. And Thomas Jefferson complained about that in his writing saying, Patrick Henry kind of got everything too easy. He became a lawyer in four to six months of study. Uh, the implication is that wasn't enough time. Uh, you can get a, a sense for the fact that there was a rivalry between them because Patrick Henry responded to that. He said, that wasn't true. I didn't study for four to six months. It was four to six weeks. <laughs> so here's a here's the thing about him. This man stood up. Uh, he he's one of the people that put together the beginning of our of our uh, philosophy on freedom. When he was young, his mother was a Scotch. Uh, went to the Scotch Reformed Church. There's a preacher named William Davies, I think. I know his last name was Davies. I think it's William Davies. Instead of the required Anglican church of, uh, of the day, which was the English church where the king presided. Now, Patrick Henry always stayed a member of the Ang Anglican church. But he went and listened to the preaching of this kind of firebrand uh, Scottish preacher. And many people said he learned how to speak because of that. But he also got the idea of some of the things about freedom. You'll, If you really study this stuff, you'll find it in... Uh, about 1770, there was a thing called uh, the the Virginia, uh, what were they called, proclamations? Um, there were 10 of them. And they determined that we shouldn't be able to get taxed without being taxed just by the body that governed us. And uh, so he wrote those. Only some of them passed. But the whole thing got published up and down 
the country. And he was a hero because of that. He also, uh, as a young lawyer, got his name because he was in this case called the Parsons case where preachers would be, be paid 1,600 pounds of tobacco a year for their pay. And the, the, when the price of tobacco went up, these guys would make a killing. And when it went down, it would just be an abnormal. And so the, the people asked the king to change that law and just make it two cents a pound all the time. Not, not to go up and down if there was a drought or something. And that was written during the uh, French and Indian War, which is, you know, from Pittsburgh. You better learn about that if you want to know your local history. But uh, it sat on the king's desk for years until King George came in. German king from Hanover, Germany, became the king of England. And he just threw it out. So that's ridiculous. We're going we're gonna to we're gonna follow the church. We're going to give him this money. And that's it. Well, Patrick Henry eventually, in that case, was asked to, on behalf of the king, argue for what the damages were. And he gave this speech about freedom and taxation, it actually was seen to be treasonous because he said, if we don't stop this king from from taxing us from 1,600 miles away or whatever, no, thousands of miles away, uh, we, we're, we're going to be able to, be, he's going to be able to destroy us. And so he had to ask for damages and he did, but the jury came back and they gave these pastors a penny in damages. And then people came and they carried Patrick Henry out on their shoulders. So he was a champion of the people. Um, then we get to 1775 when his wife died. She had mental illness and actually was kept here on this property in a closed room to keep her safe. And it, there's a lot of discussion about that, but it's actually, she, he was very compassionate about how he took care of his wife. He moved here so he could take care of her. She passed away and a few months later, not even like a month later, he was asked to go into Richmond to give this speech. And he said he would. People thought he wouldn't go, but he did it. And that's where he said, give me liberty or give me death. And then he, he was off and running to being a father of the revolution. Now here's what I think is really neat about Patrick Henry. A lot of the other guys from the revolutionary era, you see, they just kind of took off in a national way. But Patrick Henry stayed close. He was a local person. He was a Virginia man. He didn't want to go nationally. He was kind of humble. Even though he had this big house, it was made in a humble way. The furnishings are humble. He didn't try to make a big deal about himself, even though he was this crazy orator that could, could incite people to, to action. Personally, he was pretty humble. And so he stayed in Virginia. And in 1776, he was, in, he was elected the governor of Virginia. I think he served a couple terms as a governor of Virginia, maybe five one-year terms, and then I think later on in life he was elected again. I'm not positive. But then he retired, and he retired in a small, basically two- or three-room home. He never came back to something this big. And so when you see the other founding fathers like Jefferson and Washington, and they have these huge mansions, Patrick Henry only lived here for five or six years, and then he moved on because he had other things to do, but and, uh, he didn't stay here and try to make this big mansion to himself. Now there's real complicated things about all the guys down here, all the people down here at the time of dealing with uh, in slavery. And Patrick Henry did participate in enslaving people. You had 30 slaves here on this, enslaved people here on this uh, site. And I was just reading some things where he, he, he the conflicted nature, he, he wrote a lot of stuff about how slavery is wrong. And he also said, but I'm powerless to end it. I'm not sure how I can end it. It's hard to understand that. You would think you could just say, well, I'll end it by freeing my slaves. The problem is when you inherited slaves, the bank owned the slaves and you owed a lot of money to the bank. And so that always changed things. But I am trying to figure this out with Patrick Henry. I know he died without a lot of debt and did not free his slaves. He has a sister who is a prominent uh, reformer in, in government, and she was actually a Methodist and argued a lot for political freedom and religious freedom. And she did free all her slaves, and she sent a letter to Patrick Henry basically saying to him, you know, you, you need to do this. But he didn't. 
So there's that struggle, that dichotomy, these men who would say, uh, we're not going to live in slavery to the king and we're going to die rather than be slaves. At the same time, they, they had people that they were holding as slaves. So that's something that really has to get thought through and figured out. So what the effect of that, just imagine that. There's not many records here about those folks. And they're trying to actually go into the community and get oral histories from anywhere they can to figure out what was going on here and uh, be able to report on that. So Patrick Henry is a pretty, pretty amazing guy. Self-made uh, lawyer, able to go speak in, uh, and really uh, put freedom first as the thing to uh, put among people. A lot of his ideas were the first time people said the things that became kind of standard about freedom, don't tread on me uh, kind of things. And uh, um, so he's, he, probably maybe even the revolution wouldn't have happened without him it, the way it did. Also because some of the, uh, he was a friend of George Washington's. Washington said uh, in one letter, if you're in a courtroom or if you're in a political place and uh, Patrick Henry takes his glasses off, puts them on top of his wig, because they wore wigs to be cool back then, kind of looked like they were important. It meant, a, it meant a declaration of war and you were probably going to lose. I kind of like that. And uh, Thomas Jefferson always kind of, like I said earlier, didn't, didn't always get along with them. They kind of competed and he didn't like the fact that um, Patrick Henry was more popular than him because he was this fiery orator and could, you know, have fun with people and, and uh, Jefferson was more of a writer. So if you want to think of things, think of... Uh, Jefferson as a writer, think of Washington as a uh, general, and think of Patrick Henry as someone who spoke well. Didn't leave a lot of records, but he could move people through his oratory. So I always liked the guy. I thought he's somebody to really study. But he also, you have to take into the fact this, conf this confliction about knowing what's right and wrong and not always doing it. So... That's my lesson for today. Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. All right, I got a really cool thing today to talk to you about. We're in, this, we're in the town of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And I'm kind of looking around for history, you know, as I go. And I came across something I just think is so cool. First, I got to show you through the uh, sunroof of the potato here. I got to show you a place. Okay, this is the Booker T. Washington High School. I hope you've got a good view of that. It was a high school back in the 50s and 60s in this town that was, uh, I'm going to close the moonroof here, the sunroof, sorry, it's going to make a little noise. And um, it was uh, a segregated high school, which meant that there were all African-American students there. And um, it was a place that was kind of a center of their of their community. They'd meet here and have, have you know, talk about stuff and, um, and they would have uh, discussions about voting and democracy and how to participate in the democracy. And they have these evening series of speeches and things. And the local Baptist preacher um, asked for Martin Luther King to come here in 1962 and, um, and in November, November 27th, 1962. Now, the interesting thing is this is um, a year before his famous speech, which is probably one of the most famous speeches, other than maybe the Gettysburg Address in American history, uh, the I Have a Dream speech. It was given in the on the uh, Washington Mall. And I've, I'm sure you've seen that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to learn what that's all about. I have a dream. Okay. Well, here's the cool thing. The night, um, and this would be nine or 10 months before that speech, the night um, that the speech happened here, People uh, later said, you know what, Martin Luther King gave a speech in Rocky Mount where he first started talking about the I Have a Dream uh, theme in his, in his speeches. And uh, historians went back through and they looked through the newspapers and there were two newspapers here and they didn't mention the I Have a Dream. They said... Uh, that he said, uh, he, that he, they quoted Dr. King to say, he who sits around and waits on time to bring freedom will be waiting another century. And also, and I, and you know, terminology is different from back then. He, he, there's, there's a couple words he's going to use that maybe you're not used today as commonly, but this is Martin Luther King's a quote of him. 
King said, Negroes in North Carolina have to get to voting so that they can send politicians of their choice to Congress to affect the passage of civil rights legislation. That's that's a, a broken up quote taken from the newspapers. Well, so anyway, there's this oral history that, that Martin Luther King talked about, I have a dream, but the historians couldn't find record of it. And so it was kind of doubted. People said, maybe you didn't, you didn't recall that correctly. Well, two days ago, October 3rd, a news article came out. A local um, uh, professor named Jace, W. Jason Miller from NCSU. I'm not sure exactly. That's North Carolina something university. And um, he he found a recording of the speech and he had and he worked to restore it. It's a it's on old acetate reel to reel tape. And then he uh, transcribed it. And guess what? It says, I have a dream. It's, 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 it's the nascent beginning of the I have a dream speech. So this little high school behind you is a place where Martin Luther King first started working on some ideas. And he was asked a question about what were his hopes for the future. And he, he responded. Um, and so here, I'm, I'm going to read this quote the best I can. And if I screw it up, I'm going to just keep going because I've, this is the second time I tried to, to, to read a Martin, the, the, the speech here. And it's, you know, it's really hard to try to read a Martin Luther King Jr. speech as if you're, a, a, you know, no one could do that, it, give it justice. But I'm going to try because I think it's really important that we get this. And if you know the uh, I Have a Dream speech, notice how many elements of that are in here, but how it also it got polished up a little bit and got, um, you know, more elegant by the time it uh, nine, nine months from now. Just fascinating. I, I'd love to get this transcript and the transcript of I Have a Dream speech. That'd be a really cool thing for somebody to do for a senior project and look into this and how it changed and what, what happened. But here's what um, here's what Martin Luther King Jr. said. Um, and so, my friends in, of Rocky Mount, I have a dream tonight. It's a dream rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day in Sasser County, Georgia, where they burned two churches down a few days ago because Negroes wanted to register and vote. One day, right down there, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls and walk the streets as brother and sisters. I have a dream that one day... Right here in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will meet at the table of brotherhood. Knowing that out of one blood, God made all men to dwell upon the face of the earth. I have a dream that one day all men over this nation will recognize that all men were created equal and endowed by the creator with uncertain, with certain and unalienable rights. I have a dream tonight, one day, the words of Amos will become real. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I have a dream tonight that one day every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. Crooked places will be, will be made straight and rough places will be made strange. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. I have a dream tonight. One day men will undo, will do, oh, I'm sorry. One day men will do unto others as they would have others do unto them. I have a dream tonight. One day my little daughter and my two sons will grow up in a world not conscious of the color of their skin, but only conscious of the fact that they are members of the human race. I have a dream tonight that someday we will be free. We will be free. We will be standing here. We will be able to sing with new meaning. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. May every mountainside let freedom ring. That must be true all over America if this is to be a great nation. Yes, let it ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let it ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let it ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let it ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let it ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, from every mountainside let freedom ring. So let it ring from Stone Mountain in Georgia. Let it ring from Lookout Mountain in Tennessee. Let it ring from every hill and molehill in Mississippi. Let it ring from every mountain of North Carolina. From every mountainside let freedom ring. When all this happens, all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the world and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty. I'm free at last. Now that is really amazing. That was the first speech. And there's so many elements of that that made it into the next speech, the speech uh, a year later. And uh, I just can't believe 
that I stumbled upon such a cool place. It's isn't it interesting to uh, to find out history that's all around us, you know. And, and you you look at this place and you and you don't even think about it. It's just some old school building, but it's a school building where some things happened that kind of changed the world. I love that about history, and I hope you do too. So there's a historical marker down the road. I'm going to go find and take a picture of it. And I want you to uh, to look this up if you're interested. Um, the uh, I have it if you, if you get a hold of me and you need to look at it. But the um, it's the Wilmington Journal, October 3rd, 2019. And it says, King delivered I Have a Dream first in Rocky Mount in 1962. So that's my lesson for today. I hope you found it interesting. I am just blown away by how cool this is. And also, I'm going to go around the corner because I heard a rumor that there's a marker... Look at the stink bugs in in here. Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> um, I heard there's a marker where a really cool, another really cool guy I, I love is uh, was born here. His name is Thelonious Monk. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you will soon. Take care. All right, I'm going to do this one on the run. There's what I was looking for. Jazz pianist Thelonious Monk. He was born one mile from here. Let me tell you who Thelonious Monk is. Thelonious Monk is uh, a jazz pianist. And uh, if you're interested in American music and jazz, you should look up Thelonious Monk. The, re the only reason I remember him that it was cool for me is when I was a kid, I had this uncle who was one of the coolest people I ever knew, uh, who used to be the band director at McKeesport High School, and he went on to be a vice president of Yamaha uh, for instruments, for musical instruments in America. And he knew every single, uh, comp every single uh, musician that I had ever heard of. And in fact, one time he introduced me to this guy named Billy Price, who was uh, had some hit songs with a piano piano player. And uh, so anyway. One time there was this other other jazz guy named Stan Kenton who came to uh, to Pittsburgh and he wanted somewhere to play for a show and just to just to give away for like educational stuff. And so uh, so um, I don't even know where I'm at right now. Okay, so so Stan Kenton came and. Uh, through my through my uncle Ed Garbett, he called his niece, who was my mom, and said, "What's you know about find out about Penn Hills High School?" And, and told Stan Kenton that he should come to Penn Hills to play. And I thought it was really cool because it was the first time I saw a contract where somebody got to say, "I need this certain grand piano. It has to be a certain height, and you have to build a build a platform." And the the people in Penn Hills like quickly built this platform to put this grand piano on, so that Stan Kenton would come and play. So he came and played at our at our junior high school, our intermediate, Linton Intermediate in Penn Hills. And uh, it's this crazy dissonant piano, it, it, it just wild stuff. And I remember that when someone asked was asking him questions about his style and everything, he said, "Well, you got to understand Thelonious Monk." And I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. And so I looked up what Thelonious Monk is. And Thelonious Monk is this really innovative jazz musician and so look into his life um he, he his stuff is is really wild and i think his uh it was it even said it in that um in that uh historical marker around midnight was one of his big hits and uh, he had a somewhat troubled life and they uh, sometimes uh had some issues with they, they thought uh some mental illness in the end of his life and so that might have uh caused some of the stuff he had going on but Thelonious Monk was a, a, a he was kind of cool because people either thought didn't understand him at all or thought he was a genius so one guy um, I saw on Wikipedia they said they described him as an elephant playing uh, on the keyboard like just crazy stuff and another person said just keep listening you'll know he's a genius I think he probably was a genius um, he was uh, one of the people who kind of set up what was called bebop music, bebop, where it was um, uh, a lot of dissonant chords going all over the place. You'll, when you listen to some bebop music, you'll see, you'll see how it's uh, the base of a lot of stuff 
that happens nowadays in jazz. Okay, so that's it. I don't know if it's as exciting to you as it was to me, but I had to go see where Thelonious Monk was born. See ya.